Hello and welcome to Everybody Pulls the Tarp. I'm your host, Andrew Moses. My guest today, Coach DKR, Darren Roberts. Welcome to the show. Andrew, great great to be on, man. Excited to be with you and uh, thanks for having me. For my listeners and audience, Darren is the founding director of the Center for Sports Leadership and Innovation at UT Austin. He's a former NFL and college football coach, Harvard Law grad, uh, and, and a best-selling author uh, of the of the book Call and Audible, and also one I haven't read yet, but I want to I, I want to dig into a kid's book about empathy. Darren, it's so great to have you here on Everybody Pulls the Tarp. Man, I'm excited, excited. Love your work, and uh, and really looking forward to the conversation. So everybody's wondering, uh, and I followed your career a bit. You're at Harvard Law School. You're clerking at a law firm in Texas. Then you decide, I'm going to go be an NFL coach. Take me through that moment in your life a little bit. Yes. So I'll zoom in. I told this story. I, I, I've got it down pat. So summer before my last year at Harvard Law School, um, Buddy asked me to work the University of South Carolina football camp. I got there. I happened to volunteer. I loved it. Was was really enjoying uh, working with young men in the, on the football field. Went back to law school, called my parents, said, I am going to graduate, but I want to get an NFL internship. Wrote 32 letters to 32 teams, got 31 rejections. Bill Belichick, no. Uh, Wade Phillips, no. John Fox, no. Herm Edwards said yes. So Herm Edwards gave me an opportunity to be um, a training camp intern, and that was in 07. So I graduated and then went there in 07. And man, leveraged that into a full-time position and then spent seven years with um, three NFL teams and one college team. So Darren, people, I, I want to follow up on that a bit. People see you now and they say, it must have been easy, but yeah. you had 31 rejection letters and yeah. one, one hit. Um, what, take me through you know, your mindset as, you're, you know, as the, the rejections are, are, are streaming in. Yeah, Andrew, and this is a thing I, I study now at the University of Texas. I, I do research around rejection. So my philosophy has always been this. The default answer is no. So if I don't ask, I've already gotten the no. And so really, the mission should always be to collect as many rejections as you can so that you can insulate yourself from the next rejection. So there's this concept called rejection immunity. I teach a class at UT that, that has the same title. Um, and the premise is this, you know, if you don't put yourself in harm's way, if you don't take risk, and if you're not rejected consistently, then you will always fear the sting of no. So I try to ask for more than I'm, I probably should get. I try to, you know, land opportunities that maybe on paper I'm not, um, I'm not qualified for. And my thing is that, you know, all of the best opportunities I've had in my life have been ones that by which on paper I probably should not have received, but I got them as a, re as a result of, uh, of taking a risk. So basically the man, the, the short answer is just ask, just ask. So you subscribe to the philosophy that if, if you're not taking risks, you might not be growing. Yeah. My, my thing is this, if you're not taking risk, then you're leaving your life up to chance. So then you're playing a luck game. And, you know, if you walk into a casino of life, um, if you're going to play the luck game, those that has the lowest probability of actually panning out. I'd rather be the guy who's at the craps table placing multiple bets. Worst case scenario, someone says no, but who cares really, right? I think I think we have a, a tendency to inflate the no or the rejection. Like we want to make it personal. People say no for a lot of reasons. Maybe the company's not at the at the place to where they can handle expansion. You know, maybe it's a budget crunch. Um, maybe it's just not a good fit in terms of your skill set, but I think sometimes we really put too much stock into no. So man, basically go out there and ask people for stuff, like go out there and try, you know, go out there and try to pitch yourself. Um, and I coach a lot of people and I've actually stopped coaching a lot of people because at the end of the day, I think most people are really more content with talking about taking chances and actually doing it. And I just believe in doing it. You, I saw, you know, out on social media once. You, you actually put out a rejection resume, as you called it. Yeah. And it was essentially instead of all the things that you accomplished, it was all the 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 things that you were, you know, asked to do and were rejected. Talk about that for a minute. Yeah. So I think it's an interesting concept. So for those of you out there, follow me on LinkedIn. One of the posts that I have pinned to my profile is a rejection resume, and I was really, I was floored by just the um, the response from people. 
So a typical resume is a glossy thing, right? Bullet points, all the great things you've done, all the metrics that show that you were productive and created value. The rejection resume is just the exact opposite. So education, accomplishments, um, employment, like all of those categories list the things that you don't get. And what's the reason why we're doing this? The reason why we're doing this is at the end of that exercise, you're going to realize that you're still alive, number one. Number two, some of those rejections that you received that in the moment seemed like the end of the world, you'll look back and say, I mean, who cares? I didn't get into Yale, right? Like at the time, maybe you were just so disappointed. I mean, I, and you're, this is coming from a guy who was waitlisted at Harvard Law School four years in a row. And every year it felt as if my world was going to end. And then finally I got in. So, um, you know, I think that we're in this kind of awards and distinction driven world where 30 under 30, 40 under 40, 50 under 50, you know, the top 10 list in, in different categories. Look back on your rejections, realize you're still alive, and then use that as momentum to take on the next risk. Darren, you and I have talked about this show is called Everybody Pulls the Tarp. It's based all around a philosophy that I have that great teams, great organizations are powered by individuals who contribute in unexpected ways, well outside the boundaries of, of their job description. So I want to go back a little bit to, you know, you graduate from Harvard Law. Now Herm Edwards gives you this chance. Uh, is it fair to say that, you know, you had to do some things that, you know, maybe were outside the bounds of what would have been expected of you just to catch up maybe to folks who had more experience in coaching at that level? Yeah, I talk about this concept and the book that I wrote, Call an Audible, you know, for people, not just if you're looking to break into sports, but if you're looking to break into an industry in which you don't have any previous experience, I think it's a good blueprint for how you should approach that strategy. And at the end of every chapter, I give a set of pivot points. So these are, this is just a top five list of takeaways. So, you know, at some point in my life, I'm going to get around to writing a book called The Value of Working for Free. And, and here's, the, here's the philosophy. Especially for younger people, but also for older folks who are trying to break into industries they don't have any experience, just get in and add value, right? So, so my, my entire philosophy wasn't really complicated. Get in the building and add value. That was it. That's all I cared about. So once I got in the building, I had a fob that would get me an arrowhead. I just spent all day, every day, asking coaches for work, asking the equipment managers for work, asking the folks in the kitchen for work. I mean, I would I would stock food in the kitchen. I would restock the shelves. Um, I helped hold dummies at practice during our offensive line drills. I picked up um, cones after practice, clean whiteboards. And I think a lot of people, you know, our our ego gets in the way and we start to think about all of the preparation we've had in college and we think about maybe some previous jobs that we've had and we start to get the sense that we're 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 bigger than the work and that is the worst way to gain traction in an organization. So I am a big proponent of finding any way that you can add value. If you're trying to break into a profession, pitch your services for free. Now, there will be some point after you add enough value that you're going to have to make the pitch to get paid, right? But I think initially, the, the road to getting to that conversation begins with just adding value, adding value in any way you can. So I mean, you obviously, Darren, have tremendous work ethic, tremendous drive. You're a, a self-starter in every sense of the, the word. Um, you've gone on to study and, and, and speak a lot and write a lot about leadership. And so, so when I, I want to understand a little bit more about, so when you get into coaching and you're wiping the whiteboards and you're holding the dummies and you're filling the, 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 the fridge, you're obviously around some other great leaders, coaches, um, Herm Edwards, others. W what did you learn from some, some, from some of those other more experienced leaders that you were around that you continue to apply today? Yeah, I think I think here's some some qualities, some traits that I watched. One, m the good leaders I've been around have been humble, so so they have been humble enough to understand when they didn't know something, so they were willing to subsume their ego in order to get better as an individual. So when they found someone who had um, 
a deeper sense of knowledge or intellect or expertise in a particular space, instead of pushing away from them because they saw them as a threat, they brought them into the fold and they learned as much as they could. I think good letter leaders are empathetic. So they have the ability, um, Heifetz, you know, the, the leadership professor and researcher Heifetz talked about this ability to move from the balcony to the dance floor as a leader, right? So there are times where you have to zoom out, see the organization from a macro level, but there are a lot of times where you need to get on the dance floor get down on the ground and understand what the people in your, on your team are going through. And that requires empathy. And I think good leaders have that, that, that skill as well. I think good leaders are decisive. I think they take the best available information at the time and they make a decision to move forward. I think good leaders also take ownership. So whether that decision pans out or whether it flops, they're the first to stand up in front of their team and say, listen, here's why I chose this course of action. Here were the consequences. And here's where we're going to learn from it and move forward. And then finally, I think that good leaders have this ability to communicate well. And this could come in different forms. It could be in the written form. It could be verbally. It could be informal. It could be formal. But they have the ability to convert high-level concepts and strategies into bite-sized pieces of information that people can consume. So that ability to communicate is, is, is another quality that I, I see as sort of a constant, uh, consistent thread between good leaders. So let's get back to the, the balcony and the dance floor a second. That's really interesting. So uh, do you believe that, you know, if you're a leader, you might be really good at the balcony, but you might not be so great at the dance floor or vice versa. You might be one of these, you know, you're, you're, you're much more well positioned on the dance floor, but you're not, you're not as effective on the balcony. Can you learn and develop either yeah. of those? I think it's a great, it's a great question, Andrew. And I think it's, we should also think about how do leaders become leaders, right? So there's usually some appointment process, some election, some choosing, and someone becomes a leader. Now, the interesting thing is the reason why someone is propelled into a particular leadership position, like that skill set may not be the skill set that's going to help them in the position they're taking. So you may have been an incredible CFO, but aren't suited to be a CEO. You may have been um, a top-notch dean of engineering, but not quite suited to be the president of a university. And so there, there tends to be a lot of asymmetry sometimes between why people are chosen for positions and what the position actually calls for. So I do think you bring up a good point. A lot of times there's a disconnect between what the organization needs from the leader at the top versus what skills you attained in your previous position. Can it be acquired? I say, yes, it takes a lot of courage. So it takes a lot of courage for a leader who's, who's used to staying above the fray, uh, barricades him or herself in the C-suite. It's difficult to get down on the factory floor, right? It's difficult to have conversations with people on the assembly line because you understand that you're probably going to find out some things that you don't want to know. So I think that takes, it goes back to the humility and a bit of courage for people to go from the balcony to the, um, to the dance floor. In reverse, it also takes some courage to say, I've really honed my ability to work at the ground level. How do I build the courage to now think at a more strategic and high level? Right. So I, I think, you know, I think it requires humility and courage in both in both directions. But this is definitely a matter of of nurture and not nature. So to continue that to continue that uh, thought, you're doing great work right now to develop leaders. Uh, you are the founding director of the Center for Sports Leadership and Innovation at, at the University of Texas. So what inspired you to create this uh, this center? 
Yeah, I just saw a deficit out there. You know, if you look at athletes, you got a ton of camps that will ask them to run 40 yard dashes, jump vertical leaps and uh, lift weights. But I didn't see much in the area of how do we combine leadership and sports? So built out a curriculum. We teach vulnerability, empathy, decision making, uh, gratitude. We talk about strategic planning and then financial literacy. I just thought that that was a big gap in the marketplace. And and, and um, I knew that based on my experience, I felt that I was the person to, to, to fill that gap. So this, this, is, this was the first ever university accredited leadership program for student athletes? Based in, the stu- based in the president's office. So I think what's different, I think that's an important distinction. So the model that I always see is athletic departments creating some, you know, hodgepodge programming from athletic department to athletic department, you'll have different approaches. But what we wanted to do is we wanted to say, this is a three hour course offered by the university. This isn't one of those programs you're going to, you know, someone's going to come in and talk during training camp and then you're never going to hear from them again. We're going to create something that's a three hour course on the books. And we're going to make this an academic endeavor versus, um, you know, sort of a professional development piece. So that that's what distinguishes us from the other um, the other programs around the country. So many student athletes, you know, go on to to uh, leadership positions outside of sports. You know, they it, it seems that that student athletes, you know, I don't know if it's the time management, all the work that they they put in, all the sacrifices that they that, that they've made to get to you know whatever elite level, you know, whatever elite level they they are at. Um, what what do you what do you think makes a student athlete in many instances so predisposed to being an effective leader? I, you know, I think it's a great question. I actually question the premise whether or not student athletes are effective leaders. So, so one thing that we've seen in research is that, you know, the old adage was kind of like sports teaches all of these valuable lessons. The important distinction is we're finding that kids who are in programs where there are coaches who aren't leading in an ethical way, um, who aren't teaching leadership principles, they can actually leave their experience in sports as a worse leader. So I think what's important is good student athletes who become good leaders are student athletes who come from programs with good coaches. And when I say good, I'm not thinking about wins and losses. I'm thinking about coaches who were courageous enough to teach their student athletes lessons that extended beyond the field of competition. So I think it's vitally important that we have to intentionally train coaches how to teach the right way because coaches are are subject matter experts in whatever sport that they lead. But in terms of leadership principles, you know, it's only been within the last 20 years that we've really seen an outgrowth in looking at leadership as a discipline. Like it's not like this fuzzy thing that you kind of get the leadership gene and then you go on and become a leader. Like there are some practices, there are some, some core areas and components that people need to learn. And so I think, I think student athletes are predisposed to that area. And if they've had good coaches and they've been in good environments, then they can go on and you see them leading you know, in a, in a, in a, in a multitude of areas. I think one stat for me that really stands out is that 92% of the CEOs, uh, so women C-suite execs, let's say that sweet C-suite execs who are women, 92% of them, um, played a sport and most of them played a collegiate sport. So I do think that kind of speaks to, you know, kind of that, um, that tendency of, of athletes to go into leadership positions. It certainly speaks to the possibility that that they that the platform creates for them. But it's interesting. I hadn't thought about it the reverse, where you know a a a, a poorly trained coach or a coach who's who's not applying and teaching the right way and setting the right example could actually do more detriment um, over the long haul. Very yeah, you know, Andrew. At another point, you know, you mentioned time management. This is another interesting piece because you know if you're at, I'm at the University of Texas, so if you're a, an athlete at the University of Texas. We're at the highest revenue generating institution from a, as a, an athletic standpoint in the country. That means they have all the resources that they need. It also means that there's a fair amount of handholding and guidance. So a student athlete knows for four years while he or she is here exactly where they need to be at what time. 
They've got an app that tells them. They've got a dietitian that tells them what to eat. You know, they have all of the things. The problem is, though, unlike students who aren't athletes, they don't have as much experience creating their own schedule. So when they leave the university and all of those resources that they have for four years are gone, a lot of them find it difficult to be independent, right? And so we're trying to kind of build that independence while they're at the university and college students, but it can, it can work both ways. So I think we, we've got to be really um, cognizant of that as well. That's that's really interesting, Darren. You know, I I look and I and I was and I was no athlete uh, you know, by any stretch of the imagination, and I look back on my college experience as the time when I really formed you know that discipline to create my own schedule. You know, I didn't have uh, people looking over me every minute telling me you know what to do, or a high school teacher in a small class telling you what you know what you were going to do tonight and this is what you're going to do tomorrow. I went to Penn State, another big an, another big school. Uh, and, and I really had to work to carve out a neighborhood for myself, you know, mm. to, to thrive. And I, and I, and I, I enjoyed it. And uh, you know, Penn state's one of the, in my opinion, one of the greatest places on the earth and it prepared me so well, but it is interesting to think that when a student athlete has everything prescribed for them in that fashion, as you described there, it becomes more challenging when they get outside the, the boundaries of the university. Yeah. Andrew, I think, I think it's a, I think it's a great, you know, it's a, because it goes against the assumption we've always made about student athletes on the on the time management piece. And if you think about it, a part of building good time management skills is having to craft your own schedule, crafting it, um, screwing it up, right? So then you learn, okay, I need to dedicate more time to writing this paper. You know, I used to think the cramming method could work, but after getting a couple of C's, now I know I need to put more time into it. Right. And so you learn how to build time management skills by actually having to manage your time. It's different when your time is managed for you. Right. So there's a there's a there's a level of intentionality that's missing. And and, and we have to continue to think about ways that we can still cultivate that that skill set. Right. And, and work that muscle so that athletes are independent once they leave. So in, in speaking about working that muscle and, you know, and, 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 and back to the, uh, the, the pulling of the tarp concept I, I talked about earlier, you know, pulling the tarp is to me, like I said, it's, it's all about doing small things that make a big impact. I love following your micro wins uh, activity on social media. I, the micro wins philosophy really, really speaks to me. Talk about, talk about uh, that for a minute. What, what, what's a micro win? Yeah, a micro win is a small unit of victory that leads to a big goal. So humans are very bad at at not just setting goals. We're actually pretty good at setting goals, but the research shows we're really bad at achieving them. New Year's resolutions on average, 80% of them are forgotten or broken by February the 2nd. Everybody so, joins the gym in January. They, they join it in January. Everyone's having a great time. It's vacant in, in Feb, right? So what I say is this. Look, life's difficult. Life's tough. And you got goals. How do you make sure you make progress toward those goals? You set up a system in which you have a very small piece of the puzzle that you're going to work on each day. So, for example, I want to write a book. My goal today is to write 200 words, right? That means that I am breaking this thing, this big thing of writing a book down in something manageable that I can start to stack victories. So you want to stack victories day after day. So I have three categories, work, family, health. Um, typical one for work would be write 200 words, family, play five games of checkers with the kids, health, run five miles. And I put it on the index card and every day I mark off kind of what I achieve. And I just found over the long term, it just helps to build momentum. Um, it's been incredibly, you know, rewarding for me and for a lot of the people who've, who've used it. You talked about your kids there and, and I've got, I've got two little girls. You've got, you've got five kids. Uh, so you've got your, your hands full um, as, as, uh, as well. Uh, um, you also have a book out, um, called a kid's book about empathy. Yeah. And, you know, I know, you know, with, with our girls, we, we, we want to teach them the, the art of empathy and the importance of empathy at an early age. Why, you know, wh why is empathy so important to instill in kids at such an early age? Yeah. So empathy is, you can look at empathy as taking the perspective of someone else. 
I think in an age of a you know post George Floyd's murder, you're, you're looking at a country that's grappling with how do people understand what other people are going through. So empathy asks us to be quiet, to listen, and to try to put ourselves in the shoes of someone else. And I want to be really important on this point too, in that empathy is agnostic. So it doesn't we're not trying to troubleshoot or problem solve. The the goal of empathy is to try to understand the perspective of someone else. And I think it's it's a good practice that we need to teach our children because I think it allows us to, to build connection. I have a courage scale. So at one end of the courage scale is apathy. In the middle is empathy. And then at the far end is advocacy, right? And so I think one of the challenges also for us is how do we convert the empathy, this new understanding, into action, right? So we see this problem, we hear this problem, we absorb what other people are going through from a psychological standpoint. Now, what do you do about it, right? Like, how do you, how do you work on the solution? And so empathy doesn't ask for the solution, but I just want to say that, you know, I wrote this book and I wrote it back in uh, January, and this was pre-Floyd. And then post Floyd, I started, you know, I think sometimes it's easy to use empathy as the endpoint. Like, okay, I've listened, I've kind of checked the box, but it's very apparent to me in our country right now, we need people who are going to take action to to correct wrongs. So um, empathy is a great starting point that gets us to, to the point of advocacy. Darren, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let you go right there. This has been, you know, an absolute uh, pleasure to sit down with you. I, I know I've learned so much. I'm, 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 I know all the viewers and listeners are learning too. Darren, keep up the great work. Keep up, you know, get get those three micro wins today, and uh, you know, we all can't wait to see what you accomplish next. Andrew, I love the platform. I love the philosophy behind every everybody pulls the tarp, um, and I think it's important, especially in a, in a society w- that we have right now where we seem to be divided, right? There is a role for each one of us. If we think of this of this country and this world as a team, like there is a role for each one of us to play. And I think by, by bringing these messages that you really take deep dives into, by bringing them to the, to the forefront, we can start to create the world that, that we want to live in. So thank you for having me, Andrew. I appreciate the work you're doing and uh, stay in the deep end, man. Thank you, Darren. Keep up the micro wins and thank you for joining Everybody Pulls the Tarp. Thank you.